Americans are currently celebrating the 4th of July, the holiday in which they celebrate their nation gaining political independence. This holiday gives us an opportunity to reflect upon the values that we stand for as a nation, as well as our history and the lessons that we learn from it. An interesting part of America is that we are one of the few nations to have an ideological impetus behind our creation as a nation. Most nations came into existence because of the biological ties formed from a group of people living in a specific place at a specific time. Usually, as a result of a group of people interacting with and intermarrying one another for generation upon generation, certain things like languages, cultural customs, and social structures would emerge. America, on the other hand, to a great degree, is the odd one out in world history. While the culture of early American colonial history based itself on the culture of its forefathers, the British, which can be seen in their language, their clothing, and their religion, the distance between America and Britain led America to develop its own unique customs. Nonetheless, if that were all, the 13 colonies would have been nothing more than one region within the British Empire, and its culture nothing more than some localized variant of this larger thing we call Britishness. Yet, what led America to gain its independence as a nation was a series of very specific political disputes between the colonists and the British Crown. The American response to which was born out of a very specific ideology. America was one of the few nations to be created over the span of just a few years by intelligentsia, politicians, and military leaders. Even the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, or the Communist Revolution in China were not creating a new nation with a new culture or a new ethnic group. While the ideology of the French Revolutionary Government, or the Soviet Union, or the People's Republic of China were radically different than the political ideologies of the French, Russian, or Chinese monarchies, they were still living within the bounds of an already established nation, with an already established culture. It was more of a change in management than anything else. American culture and the American mindset is, in many ways, influenced by the political ideals of its founders. The founders of this nation thus successfully established a very specific set of values and molded an entire nation's way of life and ethos on that. And they could do so for several reasons. First, the revolutionary government in France, as well as the communist regimes in the Soviet Union and China, were, at times, very heavy-handed. The founders of this nation, on the other hand, were libertarian enough in their worldview so that no one faction of American society felt threatened by our independence and the establishment of a new nation. The revolutionary government in France, along with the communist regimes in the Soviet Union and China, also tried to fundamentally change certain centuries or millennia-old parts of their culture. So while these governments were successful in bringing about a certain amount of modernization and industrialization, they ultimately, in the end, could not entirely do away with every part of the culture that they didn't like. Yet, in this country, a certain amount of diversity has always existed from the beginning, with Catholics, Jews, and radical Protestant sects, that is, those who broke away from the official Church of England, being present to various degrees in various colonies, and in some places even being the majority. The Founding Fathers thus did not attempt to create artificial hegemony in this country. Secondly, the British had been colonizing what would eventually become the United States 
for just shy of 200 years prior to the revolution. No part of American culture was that well developed or deeply rooted. It was thus easy to shape the values and mindset of American culture to be more in line with the political values of the revolution. But finally, the thought leaders of the revolution were really good at convincing the average American to wholeheartedly embrace the values and political aims of the revolution, whereas not everyone was on board with the ideals or aims of the French, Russian, or Chinese revolutions. In France, for example, there continued to be a strong traditionalist slash monarchist backlash to the French Revolution for decades after the French Revolution initially took place. And in Russia and China, most citizens were not high-level intellectuals who understood communist socio-economic theory. A large part of the support for these revolutions was just as much influenced by their sense of disillusionment with the current regime rather than a complete embrace or even understanding of the new one. The American Revolution was therefore much more of a grassroots, organic movement. With this in mind, Americans are in a unique situation. To be American is to necessarily internalize a specific set of political and moral presuppositions, and to deviate from them would be unpatriotic. To be a good Irishman, to be a good Indian, or to be a good Egyptian does not always have the same implications. This does not mean that the culture of Ireland, India, or Egypt doesn't lead to a certain worldview, but the worldview or ethos of Irish or Egyptian culture is broad enough so that it can still be internalized to some degree even if one accepts a variety of different political or religious worldviews that are not necessarily the norm. Yet, see what happens if you go out in public in this country and say, I fundamentally disagree with the political philosophy of the Founding Fathers. The moral implications of what we stand for as a nation are therefore much stronger than in other nations and other cultures, and therefore we have much more of a reason to examine it and to contemplate the best way to live it out. Now, as Catholics, we do not see the cultural and political ideology of the American nation or any nation as absolute. Many Americans, even a lot of church-going, Bible-believing Christians, believe that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Federalist Papers were delivered into the hands of the Founding Fathers from on high and treat them as if they were the lost books of the Bible. Yet Christianity, including Catholicism, has its own systematically well-defined worldview including, in the case of the Catholic Church, a very well-defined set of social, political, and economic principles. Thus, while there are many good things about American political values that are in line with, or that at the very least do not contradict, biblical and magisterial teachings, we as Catholics are ultimately beholden to something more fundamental than the political values of this or any nation, and the teachings of the Church cannot be neatly contained within and do not conform to the teachings of any one nation or political ideology. In fact, it is the latter which needs to conform itself to the former, not the other way around. Unfortunately, what we see is the political ideology of this nation holding up certain values that are also held in high regard in scripture, tradition, and the teachings of the church, but defines them in a radically different manner. We see this, for example, with the concept of freedom. Many thinkers have made a distinction between two elements of freedom, 
freedom from and freedom to. In this country, freedom from often means freedom from tyrannical political regimes or oppressive social and political structures. Freedom to is defined in terms of the freedom to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. As a result of this, throughout most of American history, political discourse has been defined in terms of rights. The traditional way of defining rights in American political discourse was such that it necessarily became defined primarily in the crudest possible terms, as entitlements or privileges that are automatic. They're just there, and no one has the right to regulate or take them away. No one can tell you what to do. Not only can no one force you to do what is right, but people oftentimes get offended even if you say things like, I think it would be better if you did something this way as opposed to this other way. This may not have been as much of an issue in previous generations which held more conservative values, but more and more in today's society this worldview is leading to hedonism and nihilism. Yet even in the early days of this nation, some commentators, even those who defended and praised American-style democracy, feared that the classical liberal democratic tradition was leading to the atomization of society, and believed that the notion that everyone has the right to freedom of expression led to the notion that everyone's views are sacred and beyond criticism. Yet the Bible readings for this week and last week illuminate the true nature of freedom. Last Sunday, the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Times, we read in the second reading, taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, quote, For freedom Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. But do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love." Unquote. Jesus set us free from slavery, and St. Paul warns us not to fall back into slavery. We fall back into slavery by serving the flesh, that is, by giving in to any and every desire that we feel. Thus, the conception of freedom as doing whatever you want so long as it doesn't hurt anyone is not a sufficient understanding of freedom. To go back to the distinction between freedom to and freedom from, Christ gave us freedom from evil and sin. Yet to use our freedom to commit acts of evil is to fall back into slavery. In giving us freedom from evil, Christ also gave us freedom to do what is right. You see, humans were created for the purpose of doing good. Evil, therefore, serves as an obstacle to humans being everything that they were meant to be. Freedom from sin, therefore, does not entail a freedom to do whatever you want, but rather liberates us from all that which stands in the way of us fulfilling our true moral and spiritual potential. The details of what this looks like in practice can be seen in the other readings. For example, the Gospel reading from last week was taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 9. In verses 59-60, through 60, it speaks of how Jesus called a man to be a disciple, but he responded, quote, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. To this, Jesus responds, and I quote, Let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God, unquote. In verse 61, Jesus asks a local man in the crowd to follow him. But the man responds, I will follow you, O Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. 
Jesus responds to this by saying in verse 62, quote, No one who sets his hand on the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God, unquote. Now the gospel reading vaguely parallels the second reading for this past Sunday, the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Times, taken from chapter 6 of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. St. Paul says that in Christ we are a new creation, and therefore says, quote, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to it, unquote. So we have been set free from sin by the cross, and therefore our new creation. Since we are made a new creation by the death and resurrection of Christ, to be a new creation means to be united to the cross. We thus have been crucified with Christ and have died to the world. These two readings tell us the condition for our freedom. We are called to place our ultimate allegiance in Christ, and to have Christ as our ultimate desire. Now, unless you are called to be a priest or religious, this doesn't necessarily have to manifest itself in the form of literally giving up everything you possess. Yet, whether you are a monk living in the desert, or an ordinary guy sitting in the pews with your family, as baptized Christians, you must exemplify a common mindset, namely the desire to put Christ above all else. You see nothing more important than Christ, you let nothing distract you from, you let nothing lead you to be complacent in your relationship with Christ. You do or make use of everything in such a way that it strengthens your relationship with Christ. And even if you never actually do so, you have a willingness and even a readiness or an eagerness to sacrifice all things for the sake of the kingdom of Christ. Yet. The result of freedom is true happiness, true meaning, and true joy. We recognize that all things are passing. The only sure foundation of truth, and therefore of inner peace, meaning, and happiness, is Christ our Savior. We see this implied in the readings for the traditional Latin Mass. July 2nd is the Feast of the Visitation in which the Blessed Virgin Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Baptist. The Gospel reading for that feast day was taken from Luke chapter 1 verses 39 through 47, which tells the story of St. John the Baptist leaping for joy in the womb of St. Elizabeth upon the Blessed Virgin Mary visiting her. The Gospel reading ends with the Blessed Virgin Mary saying, Quote, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoiceth in God my Savior. Unquote. What we see is that, even as an unborn child, St. John's first response to seeing the mother of our Savior and her divine Son was extreme joy. And Mary's first response in sharing the news that she would be the mother of Jesus was to praise God. This shows that their lives were ordered to and by God as their ultimate end and guide. That same day, the church also celebrates the feast of St. Processus and Martinian, two early martyrs of the church. In one of the prayers for their feast day, we ask that God may, quote, grant that we may profit by their example, unquote. We ask that God give us the ability to live in accordance with the example of those who were willing to give up everything for the sake of Christ and his church. Tomorrow, on July 5th, in the old pre-Vatican II calendar, the church also celebrates the feast of the 16th century clergyman St. Anthony Mary Zecharia, who founded many new religious orders one of them being the Order of Clerks Regular of St. Paul, which he formed partly in response to the rise of Protestantism. 
They would care for parishes, organize events to reach the youth, preach at retreats, and so on. This was a man whose entire life was defined by service to the church. This order was dedicated to the memory of St. Paul, a man who traveled throughout the Mediterranean world spreading the gospel and who died a martyr. St. Anthony thus saw himself as imitating this great saint. Thus, in the Mass dedicated to him, we make the connection between St. Paul and St. Anthony. In the Communion prayer, for example, the priest reads from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17, quote, Brethren, be imitators of me, and mark those who walk after the pattern you have seen in us, unquote. And in the post-communion prayer, the priest says, quote, O Lord Jesus Christ, may the heavenly banquet by which we have been fed inflame our hearts with the fire of charity, with which Blessed Anthony Mary carried the saving host as a banner of victory against the enemies of your church." Unquote. What we see in the feast of St. Anthony Mary Zacharia, St. Processus and St. Martinian, St. John the Baptist, and the Blessed Virgin Mary were people on fire with love for God, his church, and the human race. All of this was because they were on fire with love for the truth, and made that the motivator of everything they said and did, and the determiner of how they said what they said, and how they did what they did, and the extent to which they said and did it. And that, right there, is true freedom.